Hello and welcome to Step Up to the Plate, a crash course in nutrition. My name is Emily and we're going to get started here talking a little bit about peer education and what it is and then we'll dive into talking about nutrition. So peer education is a program on BGSU's campus where peer educators like me and other students who are trained through either a weekend long um, intensive training or a semester long course then go to different departments, organizations, and offices on campus, and we give health and wellness presentations. So we give presentations on nutrition like this, but we also give presentations on stress, on self-care, on bystander intervention, sexual assault, as well as alcohol and other drugs, healthy relationships, and many more that you can find on our website. So typically these presentations are in person. However, we do have these online resources as well. So we're going to kind of get started here. And if you're interested in some of the campus resources that we have here, we have a resource sheet on the BGSU Wellness Connection website. So that talks about the health center, the counseling center, psychological services, places like that if you're interested or if you need any of those resources throughout this presentation. But we'll go ahead and we'll get started talking about nutrition. So the first thing that we're going to have you do is think about what you have eaten in the past one to two days. So think about like 24 to 48 hours. Think of everything that you've eaten. Maybe writing that down if you have a piece of paper or just taking it down in the notes of your phone or your computer or whatever you're using at the moment. Just taking a second to think about every single thing that you've eaten. And then to get started, um, thinking about, have you ever heard of MyPlate? Basically, it has different sections. So it has the protein section, which would be any meats, any beans. We also have the grain section. So that is going to be any type of like wheat, barley, oats, anything from that base, pastas, um, breads, things like that. We also have vegetables. So any type of vegetable, it can be canned, it can be frozen, it can be fresh, as well as fruits, um, same thing there. And then we also have the milk in the corner. So if you want to take a second, try and kind of divide your food into those different categories. And then seeing if you have a food from every food group, or if you only have foods from one or two food groups, or three or four food groups, and just kind of coming up with what are some reasons that you might not have foods from every group. So thinking about what that means in your life, what it's meant the past few days. Some reasons could be time, money, allergies, things that you dislike. There are lots of different reasons why you might not have eaten from every food group. And so just kind of trying to come up with a solution here. So one thing that you can do is stocking up on these healthy snacks to eat at home, as well as carrying healthy snacks with you on the go. So although MyPlate is a tool that's really great to use when creating your meals, and you can visually see what you should have. So like if you're eating in a dining hall, it's really great. However, it's not always super practical for snacks or something that's not planned out. So what are some practical ideas of foods that could fall into each food group? So we're going to go through each food group um, and I'm going to just give you some suggestions. And you can also suggest if you have this missed food group, you can think of other things that you might eat on a more regular basis that would fit into it as well. We're not going to give you an exhaustive list. So some ideas of fruit that you could eat. So you could just get like cups of fruit. There's something you can get on campus as well as off of campus. You can also use whole fruit. That's something nice. It doesn't need refrigeration, so it's great on the go. So eat like bananas, apples, oranges, as well as you can also have frozen fruit. So frozen fruit is going to have the exact same nutrition as a fresh fruit would, but it's going to stay for longer. So those things that you can get, like berries, you can even freeze grapes, things like that. And they're great for smoothies, or you can eat them as an ice cream alternative, or put them in other products as well. Dividing all of your things that you have eaten into my plate. So with dairy, so dairy can be kind of controversial, but drinking milk, even if it's chocolate milk, is great for you to provide calcium as well as vitamin D and some other vitamins, minerals. It also has high protein. There are other alternatives in this dairy section. So you could use yogurt as well as cheese, but those are things that might not apply to a lactose intolerant individual. So someone who is lactose intolerant could use lactate milk, as well as soy, coconut, or almond, or rice milks. Those are also available, but they often don't have the same nutrient content or the same protein content as 
a cow's milk would. So making sure that you look into that and kind of deciding what is best to fit your lifestyle. The next section that we're going to look at is protein. So most Americans actually eat too much protein. So we're just trying to encourage less red meat and more vegetable sources of protein. The only time that this might be a problem um, is if it's someone with a vegan or a vegetarian diet that has not been well planned out to plan their protein. So you could also use a meat or a meat alternative. You could add it to a salad or a sandwich. You can choose cheeses that are high in protein, such as Swiss, Parmesan, Gouda, mozzarella, as well as plant sources of protein, which could be beans, lentils, tofu, nuts, seeds, even nut butters, as well as quinoa, peas, or you could have eggs, um, which is not a plant source, but those are also very high in protein. Some ideas for vegetables is you can just get little cups of pre-cut vegetables. Those are available on campus as well as other retail stores. You can also make your own little cups by buying either celery, buying carrots, whatever you would like in those. You can also make salads. So salads are full of vegetables, just adding whatever you have into those, as well as adding extra veggies to whatever you're already eating. So if you're already eating a burger or pizza, a sandwich, pasta, throwing some spinach in there or whatever other vegetable you might have on hand. And then frozen vegetables are also great. They have the, they're picked at their peak ripeness and then flash frozen, so they have the exact same nutrients as well. And frozen vegetables are great because they're going to stay in your freezer for longer, so you don't have to worry about them going bad. And then also canned vegetables are an option. They are still going to have that same amount of nutrients as a fresh or a frozen vegetable would. The only thing that I would recommend with canned vegetables is to find a low sodium or a no salt added version because sometimes canned vegetables can get high in salt and that is something we want to limit in our diet. And then our last section that we're going to talk about is the grains section. So most Americans eat too many grains. So we're not really lacking, that's the problem. But the problem is we need to eat more whole grains. So making at least half of your grains whole grains and trying to limit those more refined grains. So maybe trying whole wheat pasta or whole wheat bread, um, cereal made with whole grains, as well as tortillas. And then also eating protein with your sandwich or with your wrap to kind of in incorporate both of those. And then the only time that grains might be a problem is if we're talking about someone with celiac disease. So they are not able to consume gluten. Or if somebody chooses not to eat gluten, then there are gluten-free alternatives for grains as well. So those could include rice, quinoa, corn, millet, as well as gluten-free oats, sorghum, and gluten-free bread. A common problem people see is healthy food is expensive and that it expires fast. But there are some ways to combat this by buying produce that's on sale or in season and including canned and frozen fruits and vegetables into your diet because eating some fruits and vegetables is better than eating no fruits and vegetables. And thinking of food as fuel. So is what you're putting into your body nutritious and is it helping to sustain you or is it just full of empty calories? So we're kind of going to move on a little bit and talk about portion sizes. So we have a little activity here to kind of go through portion sizes. So we're going to show you a picture of whatever food it is, and you're going to have some different options. If it's one serving, if it's two servings, if it's three servings, whatever the options are. And just kind of think to yourself how many it might be, and then we'll show you the answer for each one. So we're going to get started with our first one. So this is a serving of Fritos of chips. So thinking how many servings of chips you think are displayed here, and you can see the hand next to it to kind of give you a visual of how many chips this might be. And then the answer here is this is one serving of chips. Thinking about if that's how many you eat, if that's how many you typically eat. And then our next one is going to be pizza rolls. So looking at this amount of pizza rolls, deciding how many servings you think it might be. And then the answer here is two servings. So a serving of pizza rolls is about six rolls. So this is showing two servings here. Our next one is going to be bread. So two pieces of bread. How many servings do you think that would be? And then two pieces of bread would be two servings. One piece of bread would be considered a serving. Our next one is cereal. Pictured in just a regular sized bowl, how many servings do you think this would be? And then this is just one serving of cereal. Looking at the next picture, we have a pasta and a sauce here. Just looking at the size of the plate, like a normal sized plate, how much do you think that would be? And then the answer there is one serving as well. Looking at grapes, seeing the amount of grapes that are pictured here, how many servings? 
And that is just one serving. One cup of grapes is one serving. For chicken, so thinking about chicken tenders or chicken strips or something like that, and deciding how many servings you think this might be. And then this would actually be three servings. So one serving of chicken would be four ounces, which is about the size of the palm of your hand. For broccoli, so looking here, broccoli, the serving size for that would be one cup. So this is showing one serving. And then looking at the carrots, and this would be half a serving of carrots. One serving of carrots would be one cup. And then our last question is Oreos. So looking at the three Oreos, three Oreos is considered one serving of cookies. Our next is a packet of ramen noodles. How many servings would one packet be? So the answer is actually two servings per package. How many servings do you think are in an avocado? So the answer here is for a medium avocado, it's about three servings. And then a bagel, so just like a regular sized bagel, how many servings would that be? So a regular sized bagel would be two servings. One serving would be half the bagel. And then just a couple more here. So shredded cheese. So looking at how much is on the plate here. And this would be considered one serving, which is half a cup. And then yogurt, so seeing the white yogurt in the bowl, how many servings do you think that would be? And that would be one serving, which is about three-fourths of a cup. So kind of thinking back on these, and did any of these surprise you? Or is that the amount that you typically eat? What changes could you make to eat the correct portion sizes? And then how many portions do you think that you should eat per day of each food category that we talked about in my plate? Do you think that you reach this? Do you think you exceed this? And then the my plate recommendations would be that you eat six servings of grains per day with at least half of your grains being whole grains, two and a half servings of vegetables per day, two servings of fruit per day, three servings of low fat or fat free dairy, five servings of meat, poultry, seafood, nuts, seeds per day, including three or four of those servings per week to be nuts or seeds two servings of fat or oils per day, and five or less servings of sweets or added sugars per week. So thinking about, is that typically what you eat in a day? Do you think that those amount of servings kind of match up? And understanding that it's okay if those serving sizes that we saw in the pictures don't match what you eat, but understanding that if you eat more than one serving in a specific meal or a specific sitting to then just balance that out throughout the rest of your diet throughout the day. Also, it's very important to understand that you likely won't meet these recommendations every single day exactly, and that's okay, but trying to get close to them and trying to have your averages average out to be around these numbers where they're at. And then additionally, talking about that this is for a healthy individual, so if there's anything, um, any medical conditions or any other reasons why you might not eat this specific way, understanding that that's okay and to listen to whatever your physician or other doctor has told you. So now that we understand what our diet should look like, kind of based on food groups, based on portion sizes, we're going to look at a food label to actually apply this to real food. Think about, have you ever looked at a food label? Do you often look at food labels? And do you actually understand what is on a food label? So in order to show you the parts of the food label, we have a handout here that has a couple different food labels printed on it. And we're gonna go through the different parts and their significance together. So here is the food label, as you can see. We also have this handout posted on the BGSU Wellness Connection website with this video. If you're interested in looking more at it and it kind of recaps all of the different things that we'll talk about with the different parts of the food label. So first looking at these and what are your first reactions to these food labels? Do they look like what you're used to? Are there any parts that you recognize? Any parts that you don't recognize? And then what are some things that you think are important to look at? What do you think you should get a lot of in your day? What do you think that you should limit? And then we're going to just kind of go through and give you all of these answers. So we're going to start at the top with the serving size. So you can see here that the serving size is different for the different foods that are on these labels. And then the servings per container, so that can also be important just to kind of give you a visual of how much one serving size actually is because sometimes when stuff's in ounces or when stuff's in cups, it's not quite as easy to visualize as it would be to say one fourth of this package. And then calories are also important. 
So calories um, should be based on a 2,000 calorie diet, but this number will vary for individual people. So making sure that you look at the serving size for the actual numbers of calories that you are eating. So the next thing we're going to move on to talking about is total fat. So total fat is not always bad, but you should limit saturated and trans fat in your diet. Most trans fat has already been taken out of our diet by producers, but those are linked to chronic diseases such as heart disease. But mono and polyunsaturated fats are good for you and you should eat them. So thinking about that for a second, and then knowing that just to limit saturated fats, you can still have some in your diet, um, but to make sure that it's not excessive. And then moving on, talking a little bit about right underneath that is cholesterol. So cholesterol was formerly believed to be something that you should limit. However, there's new research that shows no link between eating cholesterol, high cholesterol foods and having high cholesterol in your blood. So this line has um, kind of been disregarded a lot of times. It's not really as important as we thought that it was when we first created the food label. And then looking on the right side here, as we're going through these, we have the daily value percentages. So these are a tool for you. Your goal is to reach 100% of each nutrient throughout each day. And the values can change slightly based on the individual. So don't worry about if you're slightly over, if you're slightly under on a specific day. But using these to understand the foods that you're eating. So any number less than 5% would be considered low in that nutrient, and any number higher than 20% would be considered high in that nutrient. Even the salad on this worksheet here, the salad is high in some things, but it's also low in some things. So even if you ate a salad every day for every meal, you would still be missing something. So understanding that variety is really key here. So moving down our food label, we're going to talk about sodium. So you should limit sodium in your diet, but sodium is typically found in like prepackaged or salty foods. The next thing we'll talk about is carbs. So carbohydrates are energy. So there's no reason to limit them below the dietary guideline. They're only bad when you eat them in excess. The next one is fiber. So fiber is great for our bodies. We typically don't get enough fiber as Americans. And it helps with digestion amongst other things. And there's lots of health benefits to eating the correct amount of fiber. So good sources of fiber would include nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables. The next thing on our list would be to limit sugars and added sugars. So to limit your risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, obesity, it's important to understand that a little bit of added sugar will not hurt you. But these conditions occur over long periods of times with excessive consumption of sugar and added sugars. And then protein, not typically a concern as we talked about unless we are focusing with a vegan or vegetarian diet. So unless you have a dietary restriction, you typically don't need to go out of your way to get extra protein. The average person needs about 46 to 56 grams of protein per day, but actual recommendations are going to vary based on an individual basis. And then the very bottom of the food label has vitamins. So most vitamins are found in adequate amounts in the American diet, but some things that might be limited would be iron, calcium, and vitamin D. So choosing foods that are high in these vitamins um, but also speaking to a healthcare professional, such as a registered dietitian, if you're worried about a certain vitamin or mineral before supplementing or having excessive intake of that mineral. So then from here, just looking at these food labels and some things you might think about are what is high in these foods, what's low in these foods, thinking about foods that you might want to eat more often or foods that you might want to eat less often. Calorie-dense foods are okay sometimes but they shouldn't be consumed in excess or with lack of nutrient-dense foods. So do you feel that you now have a better understanding of how to interpret the nutrition label after kind of going through this and explaining? And if there's any further questions, feel free to reach out to the Wellness Connection or see this handout, which is posted on the BGSU Wellness Connection website that kind of goes through all of those different things that we just went through. So now that we understand how to kind of use the food label, we're going to apply it to a real situation. So we're going to talk a little bit about sports nutrition. So after working out within about an hour, you should have a post-recovery meal to help recover and to help build muscle as well. So what you need is carbs and protein. So your body needs carbs because carbs are energy and we exert a lot of energy during our workout. And then you also need protein because that's going to help repair and build those muscles. So there's a common misconception that the only thing that you need is protein after a workout. So like people will eat, have protein shakes or foods that are high in protein, such as protein bars or something like that. And the problem arises when you only eat protein because now your body doesn't have enough energy to replenish itself and that's what it really needs. That's what it prioritizes. So it will turn that protein into carbs and help you to replenish that energy 
before building that muscle and repairing the muscles. So a good post-workout meal should have about three to four grams of carbohydrates for every one gram of protein ratio. So some good foods that kind of fit into this would be chocolate milk, something that's easy on the go, as well as toast with peanut butter, cottage cheese with fruit, half a chicken breast with some veggies. And now that you understand how to read a nutrition label, you can make your own foods with this ratio. And then just kind of in conclusion, understanding that there's no such thing as a good or a bad food, but all foods have good and bad qualities. So you must choose what fits best in your diet and commonly choose nutrient dense foods. So foods that have a better nutrient to calorie ratio over empty calories, which have little nutrient nutritional value. So now that you understand what the food groups are, how our diets fit into them, what portion sizes you should eat, how to read a nutrition label, we're going to apply this to real life, real decisions, and real food. So thinking about maybe those foods that you've eaten in the past 24 hours, or maybe thinking about food that is currently in your fridge or that you plan to have access to in the future for whatever that might look like for you, and then thinking about ways that you could make this into a my plate meal. So thinking of how you can have a protein, a grain, a dairy, as well as a fruit and a vegetable, and having fruits and vegetables take up half of your plate. So kind of taking a few minutes to kind of examine what you have in ways that you could make. Think of three different meals. And then as you're going throughout, um, trying to think of realistic meals, things that you would actually eat, or maybe thinking about how you would apply this to eating in a dining hall or a restaurant instead of just cooking your own food. So thinking about all of those different things, whatever fits your lifestyle and whatever fits the situation that you're currently in best. And then our last activity that we're going to do for this presentation is kind of just a nutrition little um, quiz type thing. Um, so I'm just going to give you a question you're going to answer, and then I'm just going to kind of give you a little bit of an explanation. So this kind of gives you just some topics on current trends that are happening, as well as other questions that may not have been covered. There's also a another handout that is available on the BGSU Wellness Connection website if you're interested that kind of goes through a lot of these questions. Um, it talks a little bit about that sports nutrition application, as well as some other applications that we talked about throughout this presentation. So feel free to check that out if you're interested. And then our first true or false question is according to my plate, half of your plate should be comprised of fruits and vegetables. True or false? So the answer there is true. And then this one is not true or false, but thinking of some ways that you can incorporate exercise into your busy schedule. So see if you can come up with two or three ways. And then some ways that we have come up with would be take the stairs instead of the elevator. Maybe riding your bike or walking to class or just going for a walk outside as well as going to the rec center, joining an intramural team, or even as a study break, just doing some squats, some push-ups, some planks, something like that um, just in the middle of your day. Our next question is what foods can be considered superfoods? So the answer here, it's kind of a trick question, is no food. Um, so superfood's a term used by the media, but the term's not regulated, so you could technically call anything a superfood. Um, and there's no one single food that has all the nutrients required for your body, and so you should choose a variety of nutrient-dense foods balancing together. Um, there's not one specific food. Our next question is, how many times a day should you eat? So our answer here, um, we say that we have three meals, um, but having a snack between each meal or after each meal as well. So it's better to eat multiple smaller meals throughout the day instead of eating one or two larger meals. So you should aim to eat about every four hours while you're not asleep. Our next question is, what function do carbohydrates provide the body? So the answer here is energy. So carbohydrates provide energy for our body as well as fueling the muscles as well as the brain. Our next question would be, what are some sources that provide reliable nutrition information? So our answer here would be choosemyplate.gov, the USDA.gov, as well as registered dietitians, the dietary guidelines, eatright.org, or FDA.gov. So depending on what you're looking for, those might be different. And then understanding that anyone can call themselves a nutritionist, but a registered dietitian has to go through college and pass an exam, so they are more qualified and reliable than a nutritionist.
What are some healthy foods that could be kept in your backpack or are great for eating on the run? So some of the examples that we have here could be applesauce, whole fruits, nuts, crackers, trail mix, water, peanut butter and jelly, etc. here. So just thinking about what things you like. And be sure to look at the sugar content in snacks such as trail mix and granola bars um, because some of them have lots of added sugars. So you can choose to eat those and balance it out throughout the rest of your day. Or you can also choose to make your own trail mix or make your own granola bars as well. Or just choose options um, being conscious of that. Our next question is what are some reasons why it's important to eat breakfast in the morning? So eating breakfast in the morning will kickstart your metabolism, it improves concentration, your mental performance, as well as your memory, and it improves your mood. Our next question is how can you maintain good nutrition? So our answer here would be to eat a variety of foods, including lots of fruits and vegetables. You can practice mindful eating, which would be watching your portion sizes and stopping when you're full, and do not skip meals. Our next question is why is it important to eat a variety of fruits and vegetables? And then the answer, each type of fruit and vegetable provides different vitamins and minerals, and we need all of them, so it's important to eat a variety. What are some healthy fast food alternatives? So some options that you could make at a fast food restaurant would be grilled chicken, as well as salads, but looking at those carefully, um, baked potatoes, chili, water, apples, um, and making sure just to evaluate your choices, because salads um, especially can be packed with calories and saturated fat, depending on what's in them. Um, so just making informed choices and then trying to limit excess dressing or fried ingredients when possible, but obviously not all of the time that will be necessary or that will be able to happen. So why are diets such as Adkins, Whole30, Paleo, Weight Watchers, um, any other trending diets, what are the views on those? So typically these diets, they're not practical, they're very limiting, and they're not sustainable. It's not something you could do for a long period of time. And the reason that they're not um, practical and sustainable is because they limit your calories um, to an extreme amount. They typically limit your carbs and they limit your simple sugars. So because of this calorie restriction, they slow down your metabolism, which can actually hurt your body, and you're not typically able to get as many vitamins and minerals that you need. So really focusing on that MyPlate um, diet instead of looking at all of the specific fad diets. Our next question is eating healthy is expensive, true or false? And then as we kind of talked about, that answer is false. Eating healthy doesn't have to be expensive. You can find seasonal produce, you can eat on sale, as well as canned and frozen fruits and vegetables, which don't go bad as quickly and have the same nutrients. And then talking about in Bowling Green, what are some local programs that students can use if they can't afford or if they run out of food? So actually 40% of BGSU students are considered food insecure. So if you fall into this category, you are not alone. And that means that they don't have constant access to healthy food choices. So don't be afraid to take advantage of some of these programs. So we have the Falcon Care program, which provides swipes, as well as the on-campus mobile food pantries. There's also the Brown Bag Food Project, which is a food pantry really close to campus, as well as St. Mark's Lutheran Church and St. Vincent de Paul Food Pantry. And you can see all of those on the handout on the BGSU Wellness Connection website with their contact information if you need more information about those. Our next question is, many people restrict this unnecessarily because they believe it's toxic. And then our hint here is that the only population who should restrict this would be people with celiac disease. So the answer is gluten. So gluten-free diets are on the rise. However, if you don't have celiac disease, then gluten is perfectly safe for you. So some sources of nutrition information you should closely evaluate before implementing, looking specifically for reputable, non-biased research before backing them up to support the claims. So some websites that you might want to look more deeper into would be like a WebMD, as well as what the health or other nutrition documentaries. Some of them have really good research, but some of them really twist the research and have really bad recommendations, as well as like BuzzFeed or celebrity endorsed diets, anything promising quick and amazing results, anything promoting good food, bad food mentalities. And there's lots of blogs, websites, documentaries with alternative agendas and biased science. 
So it's important to look closely at the information that you have and to find sources that are credible as well as the credentials for the people with those sources and cross-reference to see if multiple sources are saying the same thing. Our next question is what are some sources of protein besides meat? And some recommendations here would be beans, tofu, nuts, seeds, eggs, peanut butter, milk, yogurt, cheese. And if you're thinking about becoming vegetarian or vegan, um, we would recommend meeting with a nutrition professional to ensure that you have a well-planned diet with adequate protein. Our next question would be, these types of foods tend to be more expensive and comply with specific and strict regulations. So our answer here would be organic food. And organic food does not mean raised without pesticides. It just means raised with pesticides in amounts that the USDA approves. Our next question is making a grocery list will save time and money in the grocery store and will likely have less food waste later. True or false? So the answer here is true. Planning ahead for the meals that you're going to make and the ingredients that you need can be helpful in multiple capacities because you'll spend less time in the grocery store as well as time in your busy schedule because you'll already know what you're going to prepare and you can also plan to prepare meals that are based on the MyPlate recommendations. A couple more questions here. So a lack of this can slow your metabolism as well as cause an imbalance of hormones telling you that if you are hungry or satisfied. So the answer here is sleep. So sleep can even be tied to nutrition. So lack of sleep can lead to weight gain because of these hormone imbalances. And it's also important for college students to prioritize sleep, getting seven to nine hours per night. Our next question is it's important to eat a variety of foods and eat all foods in moderation, avoiding both excess and inadequate intake of foods. True or false? So the answer is true here. Calorie-dense foods will not harm you, but you should practice choosing more nutrient-dense options more frequently. And you can still eat your favorite foods, but be sure to eat all foods in moderation. And then our last question here would be, you should drink at least this many glasses of water per day. So the answer here would be 8, and a glass is defined as 8 ounces, so a total of 64 ounces throughout the day. And a tip here would be to carry a reusable water bottle and know how many you need to drink per day, usually about two or three. And also understanding that food has water in it too, thinking of like soup or watermelon, stuff like that. So I hope that you enjoyed that activity and that you were able to learn a little bit more about some of the common nutrition myths that are out there. If you have any other questions, you can feel free to reach out to the BGSU Wellness Connection. We also have the registered dietitian for our campus who she's free to meet with for any students or faculty members. Her information is also on that sheet and you can see to schedule an appointment with her. And then there's also other information that is available on the BGSU Wellness Connection website or if you're interested in becoming a peer educator, there's information about that too. So I hope that you learned something throughout this presentation today and maybe ending just thinking about one thing that you want to start doing, one thing you want to stop doing, and one thing you want to continue doing. So thinking about that and then taking it with you throughout the rest of your day. So have a great day.